Well, as I mentioned earlier, we, we do have a very short text, but it's one that, that is quite full. Luke chapter 6, verses 41 and 42. Let me just simply read it. This paragraph is made up of, of several things. that They're all related, but, um, but they're so separate that I wanted to deal with them separately. It would just take too long to try to deal with everything that's even in this one paragraph. So last, um, actually last Lord's Day, we dealt with uh, the first few verses. Um, let's see. Actually, we dealt with the previous paragraph and the first couple of verses of this paragraph. This time we're going to be looking at the next two verses in this paragraph, verses 41 and 42. Jesus says this, remember, he is speaking to his disciples, to those who were following him. Um, so this is instruction that is meant for them. He says this, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Well, may the Lord bless this, these couple of verses to um, our understanding and to our edification of this morning. Now, again, I just want to back up a bit because I do think that there is an argument that Jesus is weaving through this entire sermon, and it helps us, I think, to just get glimpses, again, of what it is we've looked at. It's also helpful to remind ourselves, because I, if I were to ask you, what did we look at last week, I wonder how many of us could, could actually even remember what the text was or what the text said. And by the way, I include myself in that, and I'm the one that spent all the time in it preparing the sermon. So I know we can lose track of this. Well, this is what we've seen. Jesus said, as we seek the kingdom of heaven, as we become more like him, we're going to be hated, hated by the world. When we're hated, he wants us to show love in return. And remember, he's already given us the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to do this. And he wants us to do this. He wants us to be different from the world. He wants us to stand out from the world. And this certainly will make us stand out so that we might be his witnesses, so that we might be lights in this darkness. Now, when we love those who hate us, Jesus says, it also shows us something about ourselves. It shows us that, that we are blessed. It shows us that we are justified because we see the evidences of sanctification in our lives. Since we're not judging, it shows that we will not be judged. Since we're not condemning, it shows that we will not be condemned. Since we're forgiving, it shows that we are forgiven. And since we are giving... Even to our enemies, it shows that we will receive in this life and from the Lord blessings on the day of his judgment. Jesus then told us something that was meant to help us, I think, grow in, in this love, in his likeness. And that is that we should be careful to avoid uh, bad or evil influences in our lives. He told us last week, if we follow the blind, those who don't love the Lord, those who don't follow his way, and remember, these people are all around us everywhere. They're certainly in Hollywood. They're certainly on the news. They're in the news. They're in our government. They're in our churches, okay? If we follow them, they're going to lead us. If they're going the wrong direction, if they are blind, they're going to lead us where they're headed. And that is, of course, to the pit. And if we follow them, that's where we're going to end up. Jesus told us that only the blind follow the blind, because they're the only ones that don't see that what they're doing is wrong. But he was warning us at the same time that we can be blinded for a time and we need to be careful to have our eyes open. That's why we need to take a good look at the ones we're following because every disciple, he says, will become like his or her master. If we want to become like Jesus, Jesus needs to be our master, right? We are disciples of Christ. That means we're following him. He's the one we are looking to. Now, this morning, Jesus tells us further not to follow, of course, the example of these blind guides and of these uh, masters who are going to lead us in the wrong direction. Uh, he kind of breaks down a little bit here what it is they do. And again, I think he has in mind here the scribes and the Pharisees. And he's going to deal here particularly with how they deal with the sins of others. We need to make sure that we don't follow their example 
in condemning others for their sins. Remember, we never, when we, when we approach somebody to help them with their sins, the, the goal is never to condemn them. Remember, blessed are you if you're not condemning, you won't be condemned. That's not what we're supposed to do. What we're supposed to do is we're supposed to come and try to help them see that sin and overcome that sin. But in order to do this, we need to make sure that we deal with ours first. Uh, Jesus is going to tell us uh, a little bit later, I think, in Luke's gospel that the, the Pharisees strain out gnats while they swallow camels. Well, he's telling us we need to stop swallowing camels before we strain out gnats. We need to deal with our sins before we deal with the sins of others. Now, first, Jesus tells us that we need to be able to see our own camels, if I can put it that way. We need to see what it is we're, we're doing, right? Uh, we need to be aware of our own sins. He says in verse 41, Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Now remember, think about this for a second. Jesus told us uh, earlier, and I have already reviewed this, that we are not to judge and condemn other people, Right? And I, I've also mentioned when we talked about that, that um, sometimes we understand this as saying, I, I can't form an opinion about anyone, and I should never pass judgment on someone as far as determining whether what they're doing is right or wrong. Does anybody else have their phone on? You might want to... Silence it at this point. Okay. Well, anyway, Jesus told us earlier to be careful not to judge others. And what he meant by that is we are not to be quick or harsh in our criticisms about other people. But we also noted that that doesn't mean that we are not to look at what other people are doing, right? And form an opinion on whether what they're doing is right or wrong and then respond accordingly. Uh, here's a great example of why it that's not what Jesus is saying, that we are not simply to, to form any kind of an evaluation because he's telling us here that we actually do need to form opinions. We actually do need to see uh, the faults that are in ourselves and are in others, but he's telling us that when we try to deal with what we see, we need to do it in the right way. So I hope you see the point there. We do have to make judgments. I mean, how do we know what a speck is? How do we know what a log is unless we can make some kind of an evaluation, some kind of a determination of whether what that person is doing is right or wrong? Yes, we do need to make judgments in that sense. Now, first, Jesus tells us that we need, if we're going to help somebody, we first of all need to take note of our own faults, our own sins. That's what Jesus is referring to again here by the log and by the speck. It refers to our sins, the log, and the sins of others, the, the speck. Now, think about the comparison that Jesus is making here, first of all. Uh, a speck, we would, would suspect, is a very small thing. It's actually referring to a small splinter of straw or wood. And here, Jesus is using it to represent a slight fault, a comparatively small sin that we might find in someone else. Now, we do understand, I think the Bible teaches us, that not every sin is equally serious, right? I mean, there are greater sins and lesser sins. Let me give you an example. It is a sin, Jesus says, to hate your neighbor, to hate your brother. That's a sin. To murder them in your heart, you know, to want to do them harm because you, you're angry at them. But who would argue or who wouldn't argue that it's worse actually to murder them then it would be simply to hate them in their heart. That's why our courts would not punish you for hating somebody or being angry with them. But if you acted on that anger and you actually took away their lives, they would act on it. So there are greater and lesser sins. But even if a sin is a less serious sin, notice Jesus is also telling us that it still needs to be dealt with, doesn't it? The specs is still a speck, and it still needs to be, um, well, again, it needs to be addressed, okay? Now, every sin, even though there are greater and lesser sins, another thing the Bible tells us is that every single sin deserves hell. It deserves judgment. 
right? Because every sin is committed against an infinitely holy God. I mean, have you ever asked yourself the question, why was Adam and Eve so severely judged for just simply eating a piece of fruit that they were told they couldn't eat? It seems like a relatively small sin. Well, the problem was God told them not to eat of it, right? He told them that was wrong, and when they did it, they rebelled against the infinitely holy and worthy God, and that's what makes the sin so serious. That means that every sin that we have committed would deserve hell, every single one of them, um, and each one would make hell even worse for us if it were not for the grace of God, okay? That's, what, that's why Jesus came into the world. That's why our Savior had to be God as well as man, so that when he paid the penalty for our sins, he would make a payment that would actually satisfy God's justice because our sins deserve infinite punishment. That's why hell exists. But that's true of the small sins as well as the great sins, which means that we should never take any sin lightly, even the specks, okay? They're still serious. But they're not as serious as the logs, okay? Now, the log, as you might suspect, is a wooden beam, the better part of a tree trunk. And Jesus uses this to represent a greater sin, uh, to murder rather than just to be angry, to steal rather than just to covet, to commit adultery or fornication rather than to lust. Now, all of those things are sins, but the, again, the first are greater than the second. Now, Jesus is telling us this. Before we try to help others with their specs, with their smaller sins, we first need to see our own sins. We need to see our logs. For some reason, um, and we know the reason is sin, it's human nature, it's always easier to see sin in other people than it is to see in ourselves. For some reason, our sins always look worse when somebody else is wearing them than they ever look on us, and we tend to be more severe against them. But the reason why is because of pride. We usually tend to think better of ourselves than we think about other people. Okay, Jesus tells us that our vision is corrupt, and we need to change the way we look at other people. It needs to be the other way around, actually. We need to think better of others than we think of ourselves. Or to put it another way, we need to see ourselves as worse than other people. And that's what Jesus is speaking about. He's speaking about humility here. You know, Jonathan Edwards is, is somebody, you know, I, I greatly respect and admire. And one of the reasons is because he had such a tremendous theological mind. He could see things that we would not be able to see. You know, we get to stand on his shoulders because he's written all that stuff down. We want to try to master it. But another thing that was outstanding about Jonathan Edwards was the fact that he actually tried to live according to what he understood. And he understood quite a bit more than we did. And he lived outwardly uh, an impeccable life, a life that was above reproach. And one of the reasons why he did that was because of his commitment to do what he found in the Word of God to do. And as a part of his trying to carry that out, he, uh, uh, throughout his life, earlier in his life, he started what were called his resolutions, and he started by numbering them, I think, and then he, he had to, um, well, he actually started by numbering them, so it, it, it made, so he could go as far as he wanted to go. He also had his miscellanies that he started with A, B, C, and when he got to the end of the alphabet, he realized that, you know, those, that number of letters wasn't going to be enough, so then he started going A, A, and B, B, and and then he got wise and started numbering them. But he did this with his resolutions. And here's one of his resolutions in which he applies this principle. Listen to what he says here. And by the way, when he says a resolution, what he's saying is, this is what I am resolved I am going to do to the best of my ability for the duration of my life. As long as I can live, I'm going to try to live according to this principle. And one of his resolutions was resolved if I find that myself getting out of, out of sorts with any of my resolutions, that when I realize that I am, I'm going to repent, I'm going to go back to where it started, and I'm going to deal with how that sin came about and purpose not to do it again. That's how seriously he took living the Christian life. But this is what he says with regard to this. This is his eighth resolution, resolved, to act in all respects both speaking and doing, as if nobody had been so vile as I, 
and as if I had committed the same sins or had the same infirmities or failings as others, and that I will let the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in myself and prove only an occasion of my confessing my own sins and misery to God. I want you to see this is the exact opposite of what the Pharisees were doing, right? They would look at somebody's fault and they would condemn them for it. Edwards is saying, when I see their fault, I'm going to condemn myself for this because I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm worse than they are. That, that's really the only safe way that we can live and, and apply these principles. Now, as, as you hear what Edwards is saying here, I, I, I know that people who read this, and even perhaps Christians uh, in evangelical churches, uh, Edwards is a Puritan, and Puritans are often characterized as being sort of the ultimate killjoys. You know, they've been, they've been characterized as saying, you know, I heard J.I. Packer say this, Puritan, a Puritan is somebody who is afraid that, that somewhere there is somebody that is having a good time, and they've got to make sure that they quelch that. Nobody can have a good time. Everybody has to be miserable. But that obviously is not what the Puritans were all about. In reality, the Puritans were those who were actually seeking the greatest joy and pleasure that was possible. It's just that they were looking for it in the world to come and not in this world, which means that they, they tried because they knew this is the only way they could get there, the only way they were going to gain the greatest amount of pleasure in the world to come. They tried to live as pleasing to God as they possibly could in this world. Because another thing that Jonathan Edwards pointed out is this life is just a breath, just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. That's what James says, right? So, but how we use this time is how our eternity is, is going to be determined, you know? Uh, whether we trust in Christ during this brief period of time is going to determine heaven or hell, but how we live during this brief period of time is also going to determine how miserable hell is if we don't repent and turn to Jesus but also how blessed we're going to be in heaven if we actually do trust Him. So it's much wiser to use this time for God's glory because then I'll have an eternity of pleasure and joy. And that's the reason why the Puritans lived the way they did, and that's the right reason why Jonathan Edwards said what he said here. He wanted to take these things seriously because he knew that eternity was riding on them. Well, to live the way Jesus calls us to live requires humility, doesn't it? that we see ourselves as we really are. And we're not spanky clean. We are in Jesus, but we aren't personally. But that's what we should be striving to be like. But we need to recognize we're not, okay? We're not there. Now, again, Jesus likely has in view here the scribes and Pharisees. They were the ones who were, the, the ones who were guilty of the greater sins, pride and self-righteousness and hypocrisy and covetousness. Jesus rakes them over the coals in Matthew 23 for their hypocrisy. But thinking themselves to be so holy, they were also the quickest to censure others for their lesser offenses, pulling their skirts, didn't want to be around the unclean people. They were the ones that stunk in the nostrils of God. But again, they're not the only ones who do this, right? We can do this as well. And that's why Jesus is directing this toward his disciples and why he's directing it toward us, because we need to take a good look at ourselves for a reality check. And again, let's not examine ourselves by ourselves and compare ourselves with one another. That's what we tend to do. Jesus says we, shouldn't, we, we mustn't do that, but we need to compare ourselves with the standard. The standard is Jesus. How do we measure up next to him? We need to see our sins before we try to help other people. Now, secondly, we, not, we need not only to see them, we need to deal with those sins. Jesus says in verse 42, or how can you say to your brother, <clears throat> brother, let me take the speck uh, out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out the speck that is in your brother's eye. We need to deal with our sins before we deal with the sins of others. Now, this, this log, uh, I think it's characterized by a log <clears throat> in the eye for a reason, because it, it gets in, in the way of what we're able to see, of being able to see well enough to help other people. Uh, you wouldn't want a blind surgeon operating on you, would you? Because he couldn't see what he was doing. Well, if we attempt spiritual surgery, 
when we're blinded by our own sins, we're actually going to do more harm than good, <clears throat> especially if we happen, <clears throat> excuse me, to be guilty of worse sins than those we're trying to help. It only shows that we lack maturity. It shows that we don't have the measure of the Holy Spirit that we need to be able to do this well. But if we can successfully deal with our sins, and by the way, I don't think Jesus is saying just in the same area, although it would certainly be worse if you try to correct somebody for something that you're doing yourself and they know you're doing it. I mean, obviously, that's it's not going to go down well. But in, in every area, okay, if we are dealing with our sins, and again, as Christians, we know that we don't just deal with this sin or that sin, but we deal with all of our sins, okay? If we hate sin, we hate all sin. If we know that God hates all sin, we know we got to fight against all sin. If we were to repent of sin, that means we were to repent of all sins. If we are doing that, then we will gain what we need with the Spirit's help to be able to help other people overcome their sins. And we'll do that, first of all, by gaining a better understanding of how difficult it is to overcome sin. And I think when we understand how hard it is to overcome these things, it will change the way we approach them. If we're dealing with our sins and we're struggling, we're fighting, we know how hard it is. Now, Paul tells us that before we try to help somebody with their sin, that um, there needs to be something that's true of us. And he says this in Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. He says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. He says that we need to be spiritual and we need to be dealing with others in gentleness. But where does that spirituality, where does that gentleness come from? It comes from fighting against our own sins. Now, arrogance, we know, uh, produces a kind of a harshness. That's what we see in the Pharisees and the scribes, where they might look at somebody who's fallen into sin, and they, they might say, why are you struggling in this area? I'm not. Um, why haven't you overcome this by this time? I mean, you've got the same things that we got. But humility, particularly over your own sins and the difficulty of overcoming your own sins, produces, I think, a sympathy that produces a gentleness and is the kind of attitude that the Lord wants us to have when we approach other people. Listen to what William Perkins says about how we should approach, how we should view others. And again, let's all judge ourselves by whether or not we actually do this. And here he's not talking about just our brothers and sisters in the Lord, but he's talking about our our neighbor, and that would include everybody. He says this, Do not despise your neighbor, but consider yourself as bad a sinner and that the like defects may fall on you. If you cannot excuse his doing, that is what he's doing, excuse his intent, which may be good. Or if the deed is evil, think it was done of ignorance. If you can no way excuse him, think some great temptation befell him, and that you would be worse if the like temptation fell on you. And thank God, or give God thanks, that the like as yet has not fallen on you. Do not despise a man for being a sinner, for though he is evil today, he may turn tomorrow. Now, again, if we have this kind of an attitude, this kind of a heart, I think we'll be able to deal with people gently. I think this is the... I mean, look at how Jesus dealt with others. He didn't just stand up on a rock and, you know, hurl lightning bolts at them. Uh, when people were really, really bad and they were very, very hypocritical, there, there does come a point where Jesus did speak out against them. Remember what he said about the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. But that's not how he typically dealt with people. He was very gentle with people. Now, secondly, if we're able to deal with our own sins, we'll also know better how to make use of the resources that the Lord actually places at our disposal to overcome these sins. In other words, we'll know how to use the Word of God as our guide. We can't overcome these sins without the Word of God. We'll also know how to find the help that is, that is really available for us from the Lord Jesus Christ, through His Holy Spirit, through prayer. 
and perhaps also know how to make use of the prayers and the counsel and maybe even the accountability of others. So through our own experience, not only will we be humbled and be more sympathetic, but we'll also know how actually to overcome sin and we'll be able to point them in that direction. Now, the last thing that Jesus tells us here is that we need to uh, also think. Think about this. Think about how others will see us. Think about how they're going to receive us. If we don't deal with our sins and we try to come and help them deal with their sins, particularly if our faults happen to be much greater and much more glaring than theirs are. Uh, Consider what Jesus had to say about the spiritual leaders of Israel, the scribes and the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, verses 23 through 24, here's one example of the many indictments that Jesus makes against them. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. That's where we get that expression. Now, notice that Jesus said, you know, they were, they were trying to be really minute in, in tithing of their spices, but they were allowing huge, gross error in, in the weightier matters of mercy and faithfulness, right? Now, he said, you should have done these greater things, I think we often miss the other point without neglecting the others, which means, yeah, you should still be tithing on these other things. In other words, even the small things you need to be doing, but don't do the small things and overlook the big things. Do all of them, okay? It needs to be complete submission to the Lord's will. But again, they weren't, and they were grossly negligent, and they were trying to correct other people, and What does that look like? It looks like hypocrisy because that is, as a matter of fact, what it is, and Jesus calls them out on it. So if we want to try to help somebody with their specks, if we want to help them with their gnats, while we have a log in our eye while we're swallowing camels, we're only going to prove to be hypocrites. I mean, actually what we will be. And we're going to be more likely to do them harm than good. So we do need to be encouraged by, you know, what the Lord tells us this morning to make sure that we look at ourselves in the mirror. Remember how James tells us that the law of God is like a mirror and it shows us what our face looks like. We can see all the blemishes that are there. That when we open the the word of God and we see those blemishes, that we shouldn't just close it and then walk away and forget what we saw. But that we see it, acknowledge it, and we begin to deal with it. And if we're not doing that in our own lives, then we shouldn't, really be trying to help other people, even our brothers and sisters in the Lord, overcome their particular issues. We need to make sure we deal with ours first. So in other words, Jesus is saying, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees. Instead, follow the example that Jesus gives. He gives us the perfect example on how to deal with these issues. And let me say that we particularly need to be thinking about how how we're doing this, whether or not we're doing this, Uh, certainly the camels, the big things and the small things as we prepare to come uh, to the table this morning because, again, the table is for the Lord's people, for those, professing, for those who are professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The uh, table of the Lord is for those who not only profess but who are also repenting and dealing with their sins. Our Lord warns us, as we're going to read in a moment, that we need to deal with our sins before we come to the table. Otherwise... Um, we're not going to get the blessing. Otherwise, we're going to get discipline if we belong to the Lord or we're going to get judgments, deeper judgment, more severe judgment. If we don't belong to the Lord, unless, of course, we repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ um, sometime later. But still, the point is we need to make sure we're prepared to come to the table. So as we think about, again, the idea or what Jesus has just told us here about specks and logs, Let's just bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to search our hearts in this regard and to deal with our sins. And then we're going to read a portion of Scripture as we prepare to come to the table and then we'll celebrate the table together. Let's just spend a few moments in prayer.